who's going to talk about fishing the deer field, assuming we don't have any technical problems. Oh. Did the TV go to sleep? Yeah, it'll wake back up. <laughs> All right. All right, so I'm John Bunker. Um, I own Square Tail hey, Angler's Guide Service in Western Mass on the Deerfield River primarily. I think I've been guiding on the river full time for 12 years now. So other people do exist besides the Harrisons, just to get that out there. Um, and this is Quinn. I hired Quinn uh, this summer, early spring, um, as a second guide. So uh, I grew up in Western Mass. I grew up, you know, fishing on the Deerfield, um, home waters, which is a cool thing. Not many guys can say they they did that. Um, and I happen to stay in the area, so. Um, Quinn, why don't you give a little bio about you? Uh, so I grew up in northern Vermont, up in St. Albans. Uh, growing up, I spent a lot of time fishing Lake Champlain and obviously doing a lot of brook trout fishing around Smuggler's Dock. So I'd say around five or six years ago now, I moved to Massachusetts. Lived in Boston for a while, and uh, pretty much when I moved to Mass, all I did in my free time is fly fish everywhere. And I discovered that Mass has a pretty good fishery. And then discovered Western Massachusetts and basically been fishing as hard as I can out there. And then me and John crossed paths and now I'm on a boat having a good time on the river with some good people. Yep. All right. So let's get going here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, you know, I think mostly a lot of people are familiar with the deer field, um, but I'm just going to give a quick overview essentially and how to fish it and with flows and everything because it is a different river compared to freestone streams that you're used to. So just real quick, we're out in Western Mass. Um, I just threw a couple of these pictures up because the Deerfield River is one of the most dam regulated rivers actually in the country, believe it or not, between Massachusetts and Vermont. So we have we have four dams down in Massachusetts, and then the rest of them are up in Vermont, but most of our water comes from Harriman and Sherman reservoirs, okay? So those are big tailwaters. The tailwater that comes out of Somerset, or that is a tailwater also, um, but that's the origin of the Deerfield River is up in Somerset, like the backside of Mount Snow. But the main, uh, the main dam that controls the part of Western Massachusetts is Fife Brook Dam, which if you've been on the Deerfield, you've fished that before. And I just threw this picture up just because this is a topographical map, but the river flows obviously east to west here. And the only reason I put this up was to show the tight lines, right? The contours between the mountains and like in the valley and the ravines. And it just goes to show like how the watershed's huge, but it just goes to show like how inaccessible some of these spots are. Okay, so let's try and get rid of these. What we're just gonna do is divide the river up into like two different sections. The upper river is like the upper 20 miles or so and then the lower river. So what a lot of people aren't familiar with is the upper river called the Dryway, which is above Fife Brook Dam and that flows into Bear Swamp. And it's, it's a short stretch of river, it's mostly white water and uh, it's not stock, so it's all wild fish. And I'm gonna get into the wild fish a little bit in the deer field because that's kind of what the deer field is all about right now is you know wild uh, reproducing population of browns and rainbows. But the driveway is a pretty cool stretch and it doesn't see a lot of pressure and for the most part it's unfloatable. You know, um, It either runs at 85 CFS or it'll run at 1,000 CFS. 85 you can't float and 1,000 we don't take clients on it. <laughs> but that's where all, you know, a lot of the white water is on the weekends. But there is some time in like the early part of the spring where it'll, where it'll run three to 500. And that's a really good, you know, level to fish it at. But there's, there's a bunch of wild browns in that stretch. Um, so then Fife Brook Dam, obviously, if you're not familiar with uh, Fife Brook Dam, it kind of controls. These are all power generation facilities, okay? So turbines and all the dams and they're making power off every single one of them. So the Fife Brook Dam is what controls the flow for the majority of the river, okay? 
and up in that stretch is the first catch and release area. So out of, I think it's almost 40 miles of floatable trout water on the deer field, there's only under four miles of regulated trout water. Catch and release artificial fly. Um, but that's where we have our year round fishery. So we guide 12 years out of the year, every single month. Every single month is different. Um, but Fife Brook Dam is a tailwater, so obviously the water is a lot cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter time. And we have a lot of uh, reproducing browns up in that stretch. So let's see. The upper six miles too, I, Pelham Brook is like the first major tributary that comes into the deer field. So like the upper six miles isn't really influenced by any other tributaries coming in. So a lot of the times, like you'll be down in Charlemont on the river and it'll be flooded, you know, blown out. Brown chocolate milk and you'll go up to Fife Brook Dam and they're running 125 CFS. And, you know, until you know that, everybody thinks it's unfishable. And this is, so this is an old map of Fife Brook Dam. I mean, the things, nobody's really updated one in 30 years pretty much. But Fife Brook Dam and this is the catch and release area, okay? So this is the... The trestle where it ends, that uh, railroad trestle that goes through, you know, 4.5 miles through the mountain into North Adams. Um, so obviously you can see, you know, the X's are parking spots. So there is parking. You know, if you haven't been up there before, there are parking spots available pretty much along the entire river, not just up in the catch and release areas. All right, the lower river is kind of unique because the lower river is completely opposite than the upper. Um, pretty much from the town of Shelburne falls down to the confluence of the Connecticut. What's unique about this uh, stretch is there's no more dams <clears throat> from the confluence of the Connecticut up to that lower part. So it's kind of a multi-species river, but it's also more of a freestone river. So it's not really impacted by the uh, release of the dam as much. So there's a lot more bug life and uh, more match the hatch kind of thing. So there's quite a few different, um, I'll get into it a little bit more in a second, but there's, you know, there's different sections of the river and every single one has got its own little attribute to it. Uh, let's see. The lower river is probably the most secluded stretch, to be honest with you. Um, there's a put in and a take out and that's about it, about seven miles apart. <clears throat> Um, let's see. The cool thing about the lower river is since it does run into the Connecticut, we get a pretty good shad run for the most part. So you get shad in the lower river and you get spawning smallmouth that come up from the Connecticut. So it's not uncommon to, you know, sight fish the four, five pound smallies, which is cool. Um, for the most part, it's, you know, timing can be key. It depends on water flow and things like that. But we've started to expand a little bit, especially since I hired Quinn. We're kind of expanding into other species. You know, we've done a little bit of pike fishing um, and others have as well, too. But when you have years like last year, for instance, so last year we had a drought, right? Trout fishing, tough, you know, not really fun. So you kind of push all these clients to do smallmouth fishing or carp fishing, something like that. And uh, then we get a year like this year, we have too much water. So all the carp fishing, smally fishing, like the Connecticut was chocolate milk all summer long. So it was kind of a, a double-edged sword because I had these clients all pumped up to fish for other species. And then we come to this year and I had to make them fish for trout again. So, <laughs> but there's plenty of options, you know? I mean, and there is everywhere. I mean, just, you just gotta find them, so. <clears throat> The lower stretch does, you know, when you have different species in there like that, like smallies, obviously the water temperature warms up a little bit in the summertime, so it's more of a spring and fall uh, kind of fishery down there. But there's a ton of wild uh, rainbows down there, and they hold over just fine. Okay, so as I said, it's all hydropower um, uh, generated uh, dams which does give us a tailwater fishery. 
but the water fluctuates drastically. So like back in the day when I was a kid, like we'd be in fishing at our knees and then my dad would be trying to save me because we were up to my chest, you know, within five minutes. But back then, not that I'm really old, but, you know, internet wasn't, they never forecasted any kind of uh, releases online. So the, the nice thing now is you can get a 24-hour forecast online. So from like a wade fisherman's perspective, you can figure out what the river is going to do 24 hours ahead of time, which is a good thing. And they pretty much stick to it for the most part. Um, so just for instance, you know, for a ballpark, the minimum flow on the deer field is 125, 135. So if you were to go out there wade fishing and it looks low, that's what it flows at, right? So one cubic foot per second which is pretty much like one basketball going down every second, okay? And then when they run the water, it'll be between 800 and 1,000. So it's a pretty big jump, you know? And if you, see, if you see it in person, when you're in a boat, it doesn't seem like much, but if you were sitting there waiting, you know, it'd, it'd come right up on you. <clears throat> um, but you can get that forecast online now, and they predict it 24 hours ahead of time, and it just helps with wade fishing. And what I tell a lot of guys to do is, well, they, they say, <clears throat> well, if they're going to turn the water on at 8 or 10 o'clock in the morning, you know, the day's over. We'll go fish in the morning, the day's over. If they turn the water on at 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning up at Fife, it takes two hours to get to a certain part of the river, two hours more to get down to another certain part of the river, right? So I tell the wade guys to go up high in the morning. You know, up by Fife, water comes on, you jump down a couple miles, you have another two hours. You know, depending on the water flow, it'll travel like four to six miles an hour. So you hop down, not even that much, really, probably four. Um, and you can fish low water all day, you know, comfortable wade fishing level. But there's just little tricks that you can do. I mean, otherwise, you're fishing in high water for the most part, and it kind of intimidates people, you know, because you can't. You can't cross the river. We actually we see it. We see it quite a bit. Yeah, we had <laughs> we had quite a few. We you know you know there's a lot of recreational activity on the river in the summertime, and we had to rescue a couple kids in float tubes. It's always a common occurrence, but so okay. So that being said, with the high water, so up at Fife. Um, for any of you that have been out on a float trip up there, we're not real picky on what we use for flies because there aren't a lot of bugs up there. That's all there is to it, you know. We just we use the same flies and we stick to them because you can force feed them <laughs> after a certain amount of time. But um, that change in water, you know, it comes up like on average it comes up about two feet in the river, you know, when the when the release comes. So it depends where you are on the river, but um, on average, it comes up about two feet, two and a half feet. So it's quite a bit. So obviously, like your mayflies and your kind of more sensitive bugs aren't really going to exist up there. Stoneflies and caddis, like they can survive a hurricane, and they have. Um, not to say we don't have certain mayflies up there, but they're not prolific. You know, there's no big hatch on the upper deer field. Um, so that being said, the fish are more opportunistic for the most part. So up there, we get away with throwing big streamers, you know, like big streamers, real ones. He's good at tying them. We messed around with them quite a bit this summer. So I got quite a bit of fishing in this summer, actually, because I had somebody to row the boat for me. <laughs> um, and we get away with throwing big dries on the bank, you know. So when the water comes up, what it pretty much does, it, it scours the bottom, but it it comes up on the banks and it'll bring worms and, you know, other like bank life stuff in, right? So, and sometimes that's key to pick up on. Um, there's a bunch of instances up there where they run water at Fife and you want to ride that bubble down and be right on the bubble because the fish might eat like crazy right in the beginning. You know, it's different. It's always different. You just got to kind of figure it out. Sometimes <clears throat> they'll eat at low water, not high water, vice versa. Sometimes they'll eat on the bubble and you just, you go 22 miles on the float because you got to catch them on the bubble the whole time. And once you get behind it, they stop eating. You know, it just, it all depends. It depends what's in the water. Um, and with being more opportunistic, the other thing is it was a little bit different this year, maybe because it's getting a little bit more pressure. Um, but 
when you have that much water in the river system, and drift boat fishing is completely different from wade fishing. You know, like we just want, we run and gun, like one, two drifts in, we want the fish to eat it. If not, we move on. But we need the fish to eat and move four, five feet to eat a fly, right? Like a client can't cast a perfect cast into the bank or something, you know, one or two times through. So, got it. <clears throat> So for the most part, like we use flies where we'll get a fish's attention and try and get them to move like that distance, right? So like the upper deer field's got a ton of midges in it, a ton. And I have clients that have gone there and weighed fish and they've caught some big fish on midges. But a fish isn't going to move more than six inches to eat a midge. Just not going to do it, you know, when there's, uh, there's a ton of them in there. So, but those big ones will eat them, but you just, you know, that's why the weight fishing guys will kind of, you know, run more drifts through a spot or kind of switch flies up and do that. They might catch more fish out of one run than we will, you know, because they're switching things up. But um, so it's just two different ways to look at it, you know. So a lot of people don't like dams and they try and tear them down and we want to bring the river back to a, you know, a freestone river like it used to be. But the truth is, I mean, without the dams in this river, we wouldn't have any wild fish. It's pretty much the way, you know, the way it is. And uh, it just has to do with it being a tailwater, you know, and it having a controlled environment, you know, where everything's a lot more consistent instead of these heavy fluctuations, especially like right now when we have super dry years or super wet years or super hot and super cold, you know, it's a lot more consistent than any tailwater. So that does attribute to the success of how, you know, the wild fishery that we do have. So let's, yeah, so this is Zor Gap. Just, uh, we do take clients through there. And so these are just the boats that, these are just the boats we, that we run if you haven't seen them. So just a 13 foot boat. This is, um, this is the old boat I had. Quinn's got it now because I guess I've heard he's pretty rough on equipment, so I haven't really, I haven't really bought him a new one yet, but maybe I will. And then a, um, an angler in the, the bow and the stern. The seats are just down to go through the rapid. Um, but the unique thing about this river is this is pretty much the only boat you can use. You know, you can't really use a Western style clack craft because we don't have put-ins and takeouts, and that's kind of key to the deer field. And most rivers, really, that because we float a bunch of different rivers, and it's all about getting the boat in there and then trying to get the boat out. Getting the boat in is actually easy, but it's getting it out. So we run the winch trucks and everything too, like everybody else. Um, but it just kind of keeps traffic down, you know, for the most part. And so that kind of attributes to the fishery that it is, also. Oh, cannot be loaded, of course. See. This was just a little fun video, but I know I was on the. Is your hot spot still going or no? Let's see. Well, it was just, that's okay. It was just, um, it's how you launch boats in the wintertime up at Fife when they go downhill and you have a bunch of snow. You kind of just let it go and hope for the best, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll have some good, we'll put some good videos. We'll put Quinn in the boat or something and send him down. And <laughs> we'll do something like that. I'm, I'm too old for that kind of stuff now, but. The boat in that video hit a tree, though. If you hit a tree, that would that would hurt. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the fishery. Let's. I want to spend a little time on the wild fish because that's kind of what we're really pushing right now on the Deerfield. I'm a I'm a member of the uh, Deerfield River Trout Unlimited chapter, and we've done a lot with wild browns in the last couple of years. So um, I'll try and make this quick, but it's a long story. Um, Pretty much the relicensing for all the dams was coming up 
It's a 50-year relicense agreement, okay? So it's a big friggin' deal. So obviously everybody's trying to get their two cents in. The Whitewater guys are trying to get, you know, start filling pockets again. And um, So what had happened was we were trying to get them to bump the minimum flow during the fall time when all the fish were spawning, when the browns were spawning. Because what we were seeing was where the fish spawn, and it's no secret now, but where they spawn, a lot of it is dry at low water, right? When that water's at 125, like all those spawning grounds are dry or like stagnant, and they need moving water to keep those eggs, you know, alive. Um, so what had happened was we started a big, a big project with Mass Fish and Wildlife and the power company. And what we did was we tagged 30 wild browns, right? So we shocked the river. We tagged 30 wild browns with a telemetry tag, which you can track them real time, right? It's a legit telemetry tag. You could figure out what rock is behind if you wanted to. And they got some good ones. They got some two-footers in there. <coughs> <coughs> so they did 30 um, browns, <coughs> and they tracked them over three years, I think, the batteries were good for before they finally, you know, died. We lost one fish in 30 years. He made like a run like six miles down river. I don't know if it was in a car or a truck, <laughs> but there was only one, you know. Um, I don't think he was, though. I think he just kind of might, might have gotten freaked out by the, you know, you have to put a little incision in him, and he probably didn't like it. But um, I will say, though, so... They have a telemetry tag, but they have a black tag sticking out of them. So you could tell if it was a tagged fish, okay? I think in those three years, I had only caught two of those fish that were tagged. And think of all the wild browns that I had caught in the three years, you know? I mean, hundreds, you know? Obviously the same ones on some of them, but you caught all those fish, and out of 30, I've only caught two of those tagged fish in the three years. So it was pretty amazing how they can kind of, you know, evade you. And you can catch all these other big ones that don't have a tag in them. Um, so what happened, you know, uh, long story short, we got the power company to bump minimum flow in the fall time, right? To keep everything covered, get a good water flow going through, and it's gonna happen next year. Um, but the last two years, I mean, we've seen so many wild browns you know little wild browns in the last couple of years i mean it's hard for because quinn was just kind of out in a boat this summer but i mean how many wild browns did you see this summer uh, like good size wild browns we see tons of them but when john's talking about like our stock of small wild browns i'd say like in the range of like eight to ten inches or even smaller or even smaller i mean it's i haven't floated deerfield one time this entire year without at least catching two or three of them i mean like there's a ton of them they're absolutely everywhere which is a good sign because last year we had a drought right so like we went into last fall and we're like jesus like how are these things going to survive you know and they had hot hot um water all summer long and i mean i caught a ton of those which are now like those last year's fish which are the six six inch fish or something like that a little bit smaller ton of them and then the next year class up which was from two years ago there's quite a few of those too but it was pretty amazing and you know, Fish and Game came back to us, and they actually said they do um, – I forget how many times a year they do uh, a float and shock kind of survey thing where they'll shock the river. They'll do it like a few times in the summer. Every, they've been doing it every year. They said that pretty much out of the data, they got 80% of the browns that they shocked were wild, 80, which is like a ridiculous number. So – you know, a trout unlimited. The whole the whole point is to not stock over a wild sustaining population of fish, right? That's like that's what it's meant to be. So, fishing game stop putting brown trout in the upper deer field from Zor Gap, like the upper six miles or so. Or actually, maybe eight miles, eight or nine miles. Um, the last two years, and like I don't know if that attributed to the amount of like little wild browns we're seeing. But if it made that big of a difference in a, one or two years, like it'll be interesting to see what happens in, in years to come. <clears throat> Good. 
Um, so it's kind of exciting, you know. It's it's we're kind of pushing towards. There's a lot of things up in the air. There's actually a wild rainbow, and well, there's wild rainbows in the river too. They're more downriver because they need tributaries to spawn in, right? The browns can spawn in the main stem, and the uh, rainbows go up in the little tributaries to spawn, and there's more tribs downriver. <clears throat> so we're actually getting funding to do a rainbow, wild rainbow study on the Deerfield too for the lower stretch. So that'll be pretty interesting. Um, but we're potentially trying to have no zero stocking on the upper river and just making a wild trout fishery, which is like a huge, I mean, from a guide's pr perspective, I mean, I'm all for it because, you know, if it doesn't work, you can always stock rainbows later, you know. Um, during certain times of the year, it is kind of nice to have a bunch of dumb rainbows in the river too because <laughs> it makes you feel like you know what you're doing again, you know. But uh, it just adds, it, it, you know, it'd be like a different perspective, like an upper Delaware kind of thing. You know, you're going there to catch wild fish, and that's what it's all about. And they can put the fish in elsewhere. So, but we'll see what happens. Um, this is a, was this the first time you we floated? Uh, no, that was, that was the one real good high water day. Where... So we've had plenty of water all year, right? Like the fishing was awesome. And Quinn's trying to figure out how to row a boat. So I'm kind of like casting here. I'm like lassoing just because we're spinning and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Hitting rocks and stuff, you know. But that's why we have a training time. But, uh, no, we had some wicked, you know, he got, I, we had some good days, like, right off the bat, where he probably he took it for granted because I was like, dude, this is not going to happen all the time like this. Because you, like, throw in a streamer to the bank, big brown comes out, like, strip, strip, bang. We no. had one day specifically where, I mean, like, if it looked like a good spot, you'd move a big brown out of it, in, like, all day, like, the entire day you'd move it. He rode, he rode high water all summer, and then we get down to, like, normal flows at 1,000. He's like, dude, like, is the water even turned on? Like, <laughs> this isn't even, like, flowing. <laughs> so, but, yeah, I mean, like, that's a wild brown. These are both wild browns, but we have a couple different, you know, colorations of them, but that's a pretty common one for the upper deer field, just a few spots like that. And what they were doing in, um, before they stopped stocking browns, they were clipping the adipose fins for the last couple of years. And that was kind of the start of it. And then they stopped putting browns in completely up there. So pretty quick you can kind of identify, you know, because it's hard to say what's a wild fish and what's not a wild fish. You know, everybody's got their whole different kind of perspective. You know, guys on the Miller's River think if a fish holds over, it's a wild fish. But. <laughs> All right, so let's just hit this quick. Um, as far as, like, bugs, um, the lower river – is more of a freestone, so you still get, you know, the Hendrickson hatch. We have a good Hendrickson hatch on the lower river. March browns, it depends year to year. Um, sulfurs can be really good in the upper river in, like, evening. Like, if you do an evening flow, we can get pretty good sulfur hatches. There's always blue wings around. Iso hatches are pretty good. <clears throat> the two I like the most are terrestrials, which is kind of – it's really later than June, but that's like using the chubbies, you know, the chubby Chernobyls that we use or grasshopper patterns or things like that. And um, it was really good this year just because the water was up all the time, and that's what you need. You need the fish to get on the banks to eat, eat flies like that. <coughs> and then what a lot of people overlook is the flying ant hatch, right, end of the summer. Like when your temperatures start getting down below like 50, getting cold and they warm up during the day. So like that can save, you know, the dog days of summer aren't really August. I mean, they're kind of September for us. You know, it's kind of like when you think fishing's good, but it's, it depends on um, year to year. But the ant hatch can save it. And the ant hatch, it'll happen in the afternoon, right? So all those, most of the bugs go in the trees or in the bank at nighttime and then they might fly around or drop or you get new new ants coming in but um, that can change a fishless day to a fishy day pretty quick
All right, so like I said, um, the Upper River, pretty much the entire uh, deer field's a year-round fishery, but we focus on that upper stretch year-round, and it you can fish it 12 months out of the year. Um, you know, we show all the clients of these big fish that we catch, like on the deer field or the hoosick and stuff, and it's like you got to come out in January and February, and everybody wants to do it, but then they get out there, and they're like, it's a different ball game, you know? Like, the winners are are pretty mild now so it's completely different i'm trying to remember there weren't many days last year where i actually had to chip ice off of a guide back in the day it was like every other cast it's just like what are we doing out here you know but the winners are a little different now so let's it's see a colder fall day than any winter days i've had in a long time this year yeah yeah when was it november october it was october it was I like, don't. It was I, the coldest I've been on the river in a long time. Yeah, I don't get cold in the boat that often because we're always rowing. You know, I never wear gloves, and I just have a couple, like a hoodie on and stuff. And yeah, it was cold. Yeah, it was cold. It was wet. That's the day you need like a little bit of, quite a bit of bourbon in the boat, actually. <laughs> so that being said, like this is a picture I've this. This was an old, old picture I had, but this is actually on the Hoosick. But, um, you know, be prepared for the elements in the wintertime if you want to fish 12 months out of the year. This day, this was a bachelor party trip, and, like, it, it snowed, it rained, it sleeted, it was windy. I mean, like, it was miserable all day long, but, you know, the fish still ate, so it made it worthwhile. But um, just be prepared for the elements, that's for sure. All right, so this one I put up because I, you know, we emphasize coming out in the wintertime to catch big fish because it's more consistent, but you never know when you're going to get them. <clears throat> so this fish right here, this fish was 28 inches. This one was caught like in the first week in May when you're out there just kind of banging on, you know, stock fish, right? So quick story, this guy was with his son. The son was in front of the boat. And uh, we were fishing buggers, you know, streamers. And we were fishing behind two other boats, and this kid would come in and, like, whack a fish, whack a fish, left and right, right? Like, out of six people, he was the only one catching fish. And uh, the old man hadn't caught anything all day. We get down to the last hour of the trip, and he stands up, and he's like, holy shit, I got a big one. And I'm like, this guy hasn't felt the fish all day long. Like, <laughs> dude, they're all big, you know? And uh, he's standing up. I look in the back of the boat, and I, I can kind of see the rod really doubled over. And it's in a little run where I, I knew a big one would be in there, and I hadn't caught one out of it yet. And uh, all of a sudden, he got it up on the surface, and I saw it turn. And I thought it was, a, like, when it's that big, you think it's a 30, right? Like, we're all trying to catch a 30. That's what you're after. I mean, it was pretty darn close. So it was the beginning of May. I had no waders on. I was like definitely over balls deep in water and like 45 degree water trying to land this thing you know and like <laughs> usually they always break off and the big one gets away but we ended up getting that one um that day the cool thing is so this is a female see her tail all chewed up from the bigger male during spawning season right so there's another one in there with her this one real quick this was on my birthday middle of july okay Blue sky, bright sunshine. It was like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and that was like a 26, you know? Like, you just never know when they're going to eat, you know? You catch them at any point in time. That one, and for the most part, you catch them in, that was in like 18 inches of water on the bank. That's where you catch most of them in the summertime, is in the real shallow stuff. And then just for another perspective, so this year, we haven't had water this high um, until her, since Hurricane Irene. Hurricane Irene was like a complete devastation. So, for instance, Fifebrook Dam peaked at like 17,000 CFS July 10th, okay? So, that's Zor Gap. It's somewhere right there. And, uh, I mean, like, pictures don't do justice, right? Like, that was a ridiculous amount of water. It just... This is the takeout above Zora Gap at Fife if you've ever done it. You could pretty much take the boat and drag it 
two, you know, across the pavement. So like normally you guys are getting out like down at the bottom of these trees down in here and you're hiking up seven feet and the river is super wide right there. So it just gives you an idea of how much water was in there. Um, and this is at one of the other corners. I mean, you could pull the boats out without, no, there was one kayaker in there that day and they had to rescue him. But I guess he, sur he survived it. There were a couple of kayaks in that day. But so 17,000 July 10th, right? Four days later, it was down to like, I, I can't remember exactly. I think it was like 2,500. And I was like texting him when I got off the river. I was like, dude, this is unfreaking believable. So I hadn't fished the river in those three days because it was just still coming down. And uh, when we got up there, I forget why we decided on it. I just hadn't been up there, and I, it was a decent flow. It's still high, but 2,500 is fishable for sure. We get up to that takeout, and I look in the river, and I just see see the color right there. It's not chocolate, but it's mud, right? And I'm like, eh. I was like, I think we screwed up, right? And they're like, no, let's do it. So we hop. I mean, it was like nonstop big browns all day long. Like, it was just, it was unbelievable. It's just like they hit the perfect day, you know? And the combination is like dropping water, heavy water, murky water. So the deal was at 2,500, <clears throat> I think it was higher than that because the fish couldn't be in the middle of the river. They couldn't be behind a rock. Like they had to be on the bank. And there were only so many little eddies on the bank. And like you just put it into the right eddies every single time and you were getting chases everywhere. So every fish had to be on the bank. And we caught little ones too, but these were obviously like the better ones that we caught. And they're not really huge ones, but it was just, it showed how they survived it, how they recovered from it that quick, you know, and how many of them there really are. So I just thought that was interesting. Plus, nobody was up there. It was Nobody was up there for a couple weeks. It was nice. All right, so I tried to do that in a nutshell real quick. So any questions? That's the end of the presentation. Yeah. Um, fish the campground right by US2. I mean, by U2. Yeah. A lot. Main and Caddis is just water. Yeah. No fish are in there. Nothing's in there. I'm throwing dries, throwing baits, throwing perches. Any idea? I mean, what do you suggest? Um, if they're not eating them, they're not eating them. Yeah. What, so what, what part of the spring? Like super early or? Mid-May. So the deal with the deer field is like you don't see, was it low water or high water? Could you tell? Uh, I can't remember. Okay. You were in those pools like right by Mohawk Park or whatever. Yeah. No, Which no, you no, get... no, no. I'm talking about the, the uh, uh, campground. Where? Further down river? Yeah, like right, air, right, country air. Not that far down, right, right by the bridge that um, it's where the where the pub used to be. No, the, the trailer park and the pub. Where they put the supply shop. Yeah. yeah, Mohawk Park. Yeah, that's, that's Mohawk Park. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yep. Um. So the thing is, like, at high water, the fish don't really rise. To be honest with you. You don't get a lot of rises at high water. In the evening is a completely different story, or maybe early, early morning. Um, <clears throat> if there's that many bugs coming off, they should be looking up. They I've should seen be. This a few years in a row, and it's just, it, it, it just boggles the mind because it's coming off in swarms, and there's nothing even dimpling in the top. It's really I'd say huh. there's, um, especially during that time of year, this like this, I started going and fishing Penn's Creek every year for all, like for like a week. Wild, and you'd find that same thing. You would like have hatches with really big bugs coming off, and fish wouldn't be feeding on them. And it's kind of like, what's going on? But then you start realizing that there's always more than one hatch going on in the river, and if like, and I have noticed a lot of times that fish are lazy. 
We're not really going to chase cats right to the surface, especially if there's a better hatch that's all nymphs that's mm -hmm. going right by their face. Then they can sit right in the bottom and eat those nymphs. And it might even be, there might be a good influx of stoneflies coming through, mm -hmm. and they're going to ignore those caddis for that all day long. Sometimes it's just like maybe try something random, or like, I think a lot, don't know if a lot of people do this, but I don't see a lot of people doing it anymore. Pick up a stone on the river and see what else is under there. Yeah. And then keep that in your memory book, and then try something that you saw underneath that stone. That could kind of be it too. And then you mentioned that they're looking at doing the uh, wild fishery. Uh, that can affect the, the put and take fishery. Are they going to expand the catch and release zone? That's a hard thing. To, that's a hard thing to do. So, like the upper river gets a lot of poaching, like everywhere. It gets everywhere. It gets a lot of poaching, right? But they're following the stocking trucks. So my theory is that if you don't bother putting fish up there, they're not gonna go up there. I mean. I kicked some out a few weeks ago, you know, like right beyond the signs, you know. And, but um, the theory is they might not be they might not follow go up there if they're only going to be following stocking trucks. But as far as expanding catching uh, regulated water, it's a hard thing to do. But that's it's there's a lot of like little ends and stuff with that yeah there's a lot of little it's possible it's possible i think i think with the stocking trucks leaving you would see a lot less people keeping fish out of the river because like you said a lot of the, like especially massachusetts makes it really really easy i mean all you have to do yeah. is hop online you can follow that truck all around the state right. and like uh i live in <coughs> pepper and i do a ton of fishing around this with the three stones that we have around mass and a lot of them fish like really good and can't hold fish over but I mean, if you guys have fished them and stuff, you see how quickly they get fished out. Yeah. But if we get like a little bit of rain after, we get something that'll spread the fish out. If you find a like a hole, like three holes down the river that's fed a bunch of fish, they'll probably be there all year because these guys are literally fishing where the stocking truck dropped it off. They'll try for a bit. They don't get their stringer. They go to the next stocking location. So it might, I mean, you might still have that crowd there a year or two after. But within a couple of years, they're going to forget that stocking truck ever went there. And wild fish are harder to catch anyway, so. Yeah, the wild brows aren't like wild brookies, I can tell you that. Like, yeah. they do not eat like a wild brook trout does. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned the north? Yeah. Yeah, so it depends on water flow. So I normally float it in the springtime. Um, fall time, there's normally not enough water around. Um, like, for instance, this year I didn't even go over there because there was so much water everywhere else, you know? Um, they put in some really nice fish over there. They have in the past. The last few couple of years I've been there, they've kind of like gone downsizing. You know, like the browns are really small. And they used to put in some really big brook trout, um, rainbows in there though. But I float kind of the lower end. He fishes the upper part quite a bit. He fishes the bear's den yeah. stretch quite a bit. It's one of my favorite rivers to fish. I spend a good amount of time waiting in the bear's den area. And I will agree with John, like over the past few years, the browns that they put in there are a lot smaller. I've always been convinced that there's some wild browns in there near tributaries, but I haven't had a ton of success finding those ones. I still think they're in there, but to be determined, I guess. Um, but yeah, the Millers has really good bug life too. The only thing about the Millers is it's probably, I'd say it's one of the hardest wading rivers in Massachusetts. I mean, you will take a spill in the river in the Millers if you wade it without a wading staff at one point or another. What do you mean by hard grade? So it's the Millers is very, very boulderly, bouldery, and it's very slippery. And that's like same thing. Like if you go to Penn's Creek and those limestones, they're so hard to wade. Like if you go out there and don't have a wading staff, people won't even fish near you in the river because they don't want to pull you out. <laughs> <laughs> But it's all it's dark it's a dark river. Like you yeah. can't you can't even see what you're wading in either. It's that tannic kinda like northern Maine kinda dark water. Is it is it tough to do the bear's den area in for wading? Yeah. 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 I mean I always recommend like a, I always like recommend a wading staff. A lot of people like a lot of people overlook wading and what an important tool it is. But if you're a good wader and you can cover water faster, you're gonna catch more fish from it. Old men know more about wading. Well, <laughs> 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 
So we've actually gotten, we're tying them like, like three and a half now, probably. Yeah, we've guess, gone down in size a little yeah. bit for a few different reasons. One, to make it easier for you guys to cast is a big thing, right? And there's a big thing with different, he's, he's good at tying them, but there's a, there's a big difference between like a six inch one and four and they get down to three. And then even like, so those big fish that I showed in that picture, those two big ones, those were caught on buggers. On, on a woolly bugger. That's where most of the big fish come on, to be honest with you, because they imitate, they imitate, yeah. in that river, crayfish, for the most part. Okay. That's what I think they're eating them, for the most part. Fish olive or black? Olive. Black in the springtime, though, you can. Tandem. You can fish them in tandem, too, put two of them together. Yeah. That's, a really, that's a really good way to do it. Is to one black, one green. Yeah. One flash, one no flash. And you mentioned, I think, in one of your slides, um, Use some tip lines for streamers. For, uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, all for streamers. Yeah. For uh, I assume that's just because the water's so fast. Right? Yeah. And, and deep. But like depending on the time so of the year. For so the nymphing game is different. Like he's this is my tight lining guru right here. So he's the Czech nymphing guy. Um. I so like this year what happened. Most of the summer, I got away with, you know, you have to indicate. If you want to catch fish, you got to indicate your fish at some point in time, right? But for the most part, I've been running them super shallow. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. You think you have to get way down there. You have to fish or look. If you're fishing underneath them, fish look up to eat, right? They don't look down. You know, trout don't look down to eat. That's why their eyes are up here and not yeah, down here, yeah. right? So if you're fishing under them, you're not going to catch them. Yeah. But um, it's like for the most part. We we're what four feet underneath a chubby or something. Like, yeah, something. We've gone to tiny little nymphs now too because a lot of people aren't fishing those, and you just got to give them a little bit more time. But or even if you put like a worm next to one and give it an attractant, like they're gonna eat the small fly most of the time or run it off like a little tag. But like depth is a big thing too. Like you got to mess around with depth a lot on yeah. a river like that because if the fish are way down there, like they're not coming up for those caddis, you know. Yeah. Especially if there's bigger bugs down there. Like if there's stones down there getting washed around, like they're not going to eat calves. They're not. They won't chase them. I tell people a lot. Like you can usually start catching fish or turn your day around by changing like the depth before you start changing your flies. Yeah. Cause like I was saying earlier, there's always multiple hatches going around. Fish are pretty op opportunistic. Sometimes you're just not in front of them. So by I usually John usually starts higher. I usually start low. I usually start right on the bottom and then start working my way up, but that's because I'm a tight line guy and usually I'm like if I'm running a nymph 99% of the time I'm on a tight line like a like a Euro nymph and type rig modified a little bit. So you fishing a tight line is great off Yep. Yeah. It's extremely effective. Yeah. Yep. Um, but some, I mean, there's cases where obviously it'll outfish other systems, but there's also cases where a bobber rig will outfish a tight line rig, no matter what George Daniels says. <laughs> it's it's usually one or the other. If you if you're not getting them on a mono rig, it's because usually sometimes they don't want a very pure catch. Like bugs swim and bugs move. So if you're not moving the fly sometime, you won't. You like even if I'm like have a mono rig out, sometimes I'll just throw an indicator right on the mono rig and then start fishing it. And just that moving the flies around can change your day around. I mean, and you know, like I said, the fish are getting a little bit more pressured. I mean, those wild fish though, I mean, there's so many of them. I really think there are, and it's not like you're catching those little eight inch browns all the time, the same one all the time. Like there's just no way, like they're too smart for that. Not happening. But like swinging flies, like you could run perfect dead drifts out of a boat. It's super easy. You flop it over, we roll you down. Like they're perfect for the most part. Little mend here and there. And then when they don't eat it for two hours, you anchor up and let the client swing it through and then all of a sudden it gets whacked, you know? I mean, for the most part, you can kind of crack the code a little bit, but there's just um, sometimes they want moving moving bugs, even if bugs aren't coming off. You know, they just want a little bit of a little bit of flutter in it.
They can be finicky from time to time. <clears throat> so, any more questions? I guess I would just say uh, uh, how far uh, is advanced in cooking, and if someone wants to cook a certain day. Um, what are we in December? <laughs> yeah. Um, springtime books quick, but obviously it's like different now because I got him. Now I get to hand pick my clients, you know. <laughs> I'm only gonna say this because it's 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 funny, right? So Quinn's been bringing down his own clients this fall to fish with us, and uh, so what's the, if you tell this story, it'd be a lot funnier. Yeah, so like, I so, a, so I rarely, a, yeah, I had a guy that he came, I think he came from Minnesota. I've known him for years and he had a really, really tough day. Like when I say a tough day, I mean like he had a really tough day, like snapped a rod in half, like, um, his ears didn't work. So like he couldn't listen at all. I mean, like, I'd be like, we're going through the trees, please don't cast. And he would immediately cast. Into the <laughs> I mean, it's the only trip, it's the only trip I've ever been like, I, I stopped it. Like, Literally, we got to a point on this whip, and I was like, we're not going to be able to finish the trip because just keep breaking everything. You won't listen to me. We're not going to catch fish. So, like, we're going to have to vacate. I mean, the guy, like, didn't even remember a couple minutes later that I told him we were vacating the river. So, like, it was pretty bad. So when I got off the river, John asked me how it was, and I told him, if like, I ever call you again, tell him I died in the whitewater. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, like, 12 years, I've had maybe one client like that. So he got his out of the way. Yeah. So, <laughs> right off the bat. I had a great trip the next day, though. So <laughs> I gave him some of my clients. So yeah, I did too. I took one of John's clients the next day. It was awesome. <laughs> but um, yeah. So like people book in the winter time for spring. I mean, if you want a May and June trip, like you, you got to book them ahead of time. But it's different now than before because so what i was doing before like i was subcontracting second boats out and it just doesn't work well and so i was just really fortunate to find him and so it'll be it'll be different this year for sure but we, yeah should be doing quite a few boats one last question what are your tips for fishing high and low water river in the upper section so i don't see it often but when i do the guy's doing something right so when we're floating down the river high water normally Right? When I see the guy do get on shore, walk out, and then turn towards shore and start fishing, he knows what he's doing. Right? It depends like how long the water's up too. I mean, the longer the water's up, more fish will get on the bank. If the water goes up and down like a daily routine kind of thing, the fish are in the routine. So they might not move out of those pockets in the middle, right? So you can get them out of the middle of the river. But there's also some fish that go right to the bank. There's always fish that are always on the bank at low water, you know. But in theory, the longer the water's up on the deer field, the more fish will move to the bank at some, at some point in time. Depends on the stretch, too. Like up at Fife, they'll do it a lot more often than they will downriver. Like you get in Charlemont stretch down there, and it just more water just makes it harder to get to those fish because they don't leave. They're in the runs. They don't leave. They don't have banks to go to like they do on the upper. Like every stretch is different. But I always have a golden rule for fishing no matter what, but especially if you're fishing high water and you're waiting, mm -hmm. you fish it before you wait it. I won't step in anything that I haven't fished yet. Because, I mean, like I've seen I've seen drought, like drought in spots that would scare you. It's so shallow and pretty much touching the bank. Like yeah. you, you spooked him when you slammed the door of your truck. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. like that's one thing that – I had drilled into my head by a buddy who fishes like nothing but pocket water, and he he will not walk through something if he hasn't fished it yet, mm -hmm. and it it'll pay off. I mean, you might have a year where you like fish right next to the bank and don't catch anything, mm -hmm. and then you might have those few times where you catch an over twenty inch wild brown right at your feet. Yeah, depends on the time of the year too. Obviously, in the summer, if they're seeing like grasshoppers on a windy day. Like they're going to go to the bank. But it depends on the river also. I mean, the deer field, you know the fish are there. And they're pretty much everywhere. Like now I've learned my lesson when clients ask me if there's any fish there. And I used to say no. And then they'd cast in and catch one. <laughs> right? <laughs> Two times. That's all it took. And then I, I learned not to say that anymore. 
or you're dragging a fly across the boat. They're they're everywhere. They really are, you know. I mean, we catch them on accident. I mean, John's caught them before while I'm like rolling through stuff, and I did not want him to have a fish on his line at all. Yeah. And like, literally, just with a fly in the water, hanging out the side of the boat, catch a fish. Oh. Those are the good days. Yeah. Some days you can do everything right and not catch them. So you know, having fish is different. So like what I mentioned if earlier, if, if you figure out the time they're going to run water, I mean, it depends. If you want to fish like high, high water, then you, you, you fish the release. But if you want to fish your low water and possibly have some dry fly fishing, if they run water at 8, you can get up there and fish the morning. It doesn't take, it takes ten, two hours to get to the wa uh, for the water to get to Zor Gap, if you know where Zor Gap is, okay? And it takes another two hours to get down to Charlemont. But it takes five hours to get down to Crab Apple. So you can fish all that Route 2 stuff all day long in low water for the most part of the day. Because water won't be on that early. It's normally like 10 or 11 if you turn it on. Um, so would you, like, it, you recommend the low water? I like hot high water because most of those bigger fish eat at high water. But for, but for wade fishing, lower water. So, and as far as like spots, like don't, a lot of people think like they, you know, they stock the trout in certain areas underneath the bridges and stuff like that. And there's a ton of them there, but there's wild trout right in there with them, you know. Maybe not big ones, but the wild trout are right there next to the stockfish. What happens, though, during the spring, you'll catch, like, these big browns right through March and most of April. They throw the fish in, or the fish start to eat and wake up and figure out that they're not a tank anymore. Those wild browns actually, like, leave. Like, they know the routine. Like, they do not want to be, like, stocked rainbows are literally a pain in the ass. Yeah, they they eat everything for like two weeks. Like you catch them on anything. They do. They eat absolutely everything for like once they wake up. There's like a good two weeks span where they pretty much eat anything you put in the water. Huh. But those browns will leave, and that's why you catch them on the banks. Like they'll go on to. They're used to going to certain banks, and they'll like a big one, an old one, will keep doing it year after year. And he'll stay even at low water. He'll stay right there because we'll float like low water stretches if we have to, and like you'll spook like a two footer out of like that much water on the bank. In the wide open. I'd say one thing as far as waiting, like a lot of people are timid of the high water, and like you, you really don't need to be. It's definitely good to like respect the high water. But like we we're saying, especially in the high water, a lot of those fish are on the bank. You don't need to wait in the water a whole entire lot. I think a lot of people would be surprised at how many fish they caught without getting their waders wet with a fly rod. The especially with the right rods and stuff too. I always like 10 foot rods gone. Well, I was going to get to, yeah. So what I was going to say was like, they're used to seeing boats, like white water boats or used to people. Like we catch all of our fish, like under the rod tip, 10 foot rods, but under the rod tip, you know, like if I want you to cast the other side of the river, I'll row you over there, you know, and everybody wants to cast, but we, you want to be right on top of those fish and you can be low water. They're a little bit more spooky. So at low water, most of them have a tendency to congregate in, you know, the better lies, especially if they're, you know, stockfish. They'll get in those little, and it doesn't have to be deep water. It just has to be deeper water than what's around them, right? It doesn't matter if it's this. If everything around it is that, they're going to be right here, right? It doesn't matter. Like, there's so many fish in that. Like, when you look in there and you say there's no fish in there, like, they're in there. Yeah. Those riffles are loaded with fish. I, so, it, but like that's really good big brown banks right there. Yeah. Like we get big browns off there all the time. That's like the pictures of him holding them was right there. And they're in there. So why do you guys use 10 foot rods? Easier to cast um, with out of the boat with clients, easier to mend, less line on the water really. So it all depends. Like some clients love to mend, but they're mending too much. So like for instance, in a boat, you do a lot of downstream mending. 
everybody thinks they got a men upriver the whole time. So, it, yeah. right? Because you're moving in the boat. You're right, but you keep, but you want to see the take. So what I tell it, this is hard to explain, but you got your, you got river going. You always want your fly to be going down first, yeah. right? And you want it to be, you want to have micro drag on your indicator. Because as soon as that fish eats it, you want to see it. Right, if you do these big mends and keep mending your indicator over, it's a perfect drift. Your fly is going to go down through, but all if the fish just goes like that, indicator is going to float like six it. feet before yeah. it, like it, you won't even see it. Yeah. So that's why like the tight line thing works out too, because like you can get the client to just stick it in there and they feel it. It's an automatic. You, I mean, you see it for the most part too. Yeah, yeah. But that's why we say mend down down river all the time. A lot of guys don't notice it because they're in these fast ripples. They're fishing stock fish, and the water's so fast because the, the top current's faster than the bottom current, right? So it's like a mind game, but you're trying to always mend it, mend it, mend it. No matter what, you can't keep up with it. And the fish hit it so hard that, you know, stock fish hit it so hard that you don't notice. But, like, when you get into wild fish and try and figure them out, the drift, there's a lot that goes into an indicator rig for sure. Is that it? Cool.